Film is the perfect outlet for artists to express their ideas in a way understandable to the widest audience. These themes could come in the form of simple cartoons with an underlying message or lesson to take home, often with little to no room for ambiguity, but the most impactful films often come in the form of thought-provoking, multi-layered stories showcasing common, real-world struggles relatable to anyone and yet will still manage to leave you moved and a changed person in the end. Not necessarily meant to elicit specific emotions from the audience per se, but rather left to the interpretation of whoever watching to find their own meaning and theme from what's given, since our mindset and experiences tend to shape how we interpret the meaning of media that requires any form of interpretation. Even if the artist's original intended meaning isn't quite how we interpret it, that's not really the point. The point is that we can find our own meaning and enjoyment from the media provided to us by the creative geniuses capable of crafting something multi-layered and thought-provoking enough to elicit a variety of emotions depending on who's watching. It's creative expression after all, something that can only come from the mind of an artist. Not all film needs to elicit such profound emotions though, and that's fine. All media has its purpose and an equal place in society, and it's unfair to rate a film in a category it's not trying to compete in, kinda like how we don't criticize Nintendo for not pushing the boundaries in technological innovation with their consoles and video game graphics. It's simply not a category they want to compete in, as they would rather focus on pumping out games and consoles that put an emphasis in accessibility and reachability for all players. Whether it be for casuals who have never even picked up a game controller, or hardcore video game fans. It's the same reason why we don't criticize documentaries and docudramas for not portraying historical events in the most mind-bending, thought-provoking commentary possible, but we'll happily and very passionately point out minor historical inaccuracies such as period inaccurate clothing, unrealistic sinkings, and the validity of how certain historical figures are portrayed. Finally, it's the same reason why we don't criticize historical fiction films when certain historical events are altered to fit more cohesively into a story's narrative, as long as the alterations made serve to benefit the story in a compelling and interesting way, and actually make sense in the context of the historical events being told. So while, for example, it's true that Thomas Andrews never actually gave the fictional characters of Rose and Cal a guided tour around the Titanic, it is a fact that Andrews was very proud of his work in real life, and was incredibly dedicated in making sure every inch of the ship's space served a purpose. So while this particular event may not have happened, it's not crazy to imagine Andrews helping passengers understand their way around the massive ship. Likewise, in this case, the bending of historical events serves to progress the story, since Rose is placed out in the open decks of Titanic, the perfect spot for Jack to get her attention. Sure, there are a multitude of ways this sequence of events could have played out that wouldn't necessitate the bending of historical events, but this doesn't detract from the fact that what does play out makes sense in the context of the story and serves to progress our characters into the next scene in a semi-believable way, although admittedly a bit contrived. The Britannic movie tries to accomplish this feat of bending historical events around its insanely unrealistic plot. Well, tries is a bit of an overstatement, but anyway. The more unrealistic you make the plot of your historical fiction film in the context of the events to which the plot takes place, the more challenging it becomes to make said unrealistic plot believable for a mass audience. James Cameron's film, as well as most other historical fiction films, work in this regard because all of the fictional elements, Jack, Rose, her mentally abusive mother, her physically abusive fiance, <laughs> are simple bystanders in the grand scheme of the Titanic tragedy, and their interactions with each other, heck, even real historical figures, don't drastically affect the causes and eventual outcome of the historical events to which the plot takes place in. Likewise, the fictional elements added are believable enough in the context of the historical period where they could probably fit neatly into the Titanic canon as is without changing the course of history. The Britannic movie is not this. Not only is historical accuracy thrown out the door to make way for the plot, 
Like seriously, it's hard to even call this a movie about Britannic with how little the movie's plot is tied to the historical Britannic. But any hint of realism that you would expect from a historical fiction film that takes place on a World War I hospital ship is non-existent, to the point where scenes can sometimes devolve into cartoonish levels of insanity. Simply put, this is not a film about Britannic sinking, and if you're going into it expecting something similar to James Cameron's Titanic or Lusitania Terror at Sea, you will be very disappointed. So, if you are planning on watching this movie disregarding the complete lack of realism, which I will get into in a bit, don't think of it so much as a movie about Britannic sinking, don't even think of it as a movie that takes place on Britannic during her sinking, rather, Think of it as a movie-length Squire skit. You boys wouldn't happen to know the way to Pearl Harbor, would you? I appear to be lost. Funny, just last magic Japanese carry asked me the exact same thing. What? I'm not trying to say that you aren't allowed to have unrealistic elements in your historical fiction film, or that you can't drastically change history to make what, at least in the case of Britannic historically, was a pretty unimpactful and kind of boring sinking, all things considered. The problem with the Britannic movie, though, is that it is very obvious that the lack of realism, as well as the almost constant stream of historical inaccuracies, aren't an intentional choice to benefit the story, besides the whole U-boat plotline and Molotov sinking, I suppose. But besides this, most of the issues I have simply stem from a lack of care and research into Britannic's history and the history surrounding the time period. World War I U-boat tactics, how torpedo and machine guns function, the true destructive capabilities of a makeshift Molotov cocktail, the basic physics of how ships die. Okay, maybe that last one was a bit unfair, but you get what I'm talking about. You know what, how about I list off a few issues I found throughout the movie. I understand that our main character, Vera Campbell, accompanies the old lady and her kids as a cover so she can board the Britannic and find the alleged German spy, but why does she need this cover in particular? Wouldn't it make far more sense to go undercover as a nurse, perhaps? The Admiralty are the ones who send her on this secret mission so I'm sure they could make arrangements. It wouldn't be too hard for a trained spy to do spy things such as cover as a nurse, and it would fit far more cohesively into the whole hospital ship thing rather than being the governess of an old lady and her kids. Wait, why exactly do the old lady's kids need to come with her on board a hospital ship traveling through a war zone? As a matter of fact, why do the old lady and kids even need to exist in the first place besides to be our protagonist's cover? I get that the old lady, whose name is Lady Lewis in the movie, is being transported to her husband, an ambassador for Great Britain, but it's not like these are historical characters. They're made for the movie, so you don't really need them, especially since they don't really contribute to the story in the end besides some antics during the sinking that are incredibly contrived. If you really want another woman for our protagonist to interact with, Lady Lewis could easily be working to another nurse character, which would make even more sense if Vera Campbell was undercover as a nurse, and likewise wouldn't require such alterations to history. Why is Captain Bartlett, and as far as I know, the fictional First Officer Townsend, such assholes to our protagonist? Why is Townsend in the wheelhouse ordering evasive maneuvers one minute, then wandering the B-deck promenade the next? How is a German U-boat able to keep up with a four-funneled ocean liner? What's the point of this whole Titanic PTSD plotline that goes literally nowhere and only exists to make our protagonist and antagonist fall in love? Maybe this could work in a film with better writing, but it's just not interesting here. Wow, a few stokers versus a crew of Royal Navy personnel? I wonder how this is going to turn out. I've killed a man. Yes. You must feel awful. Yes, I do.
Admittedly, this is a pretty good and tenseful scene, but wow, it's very convenient that Britannic's escort arrives just before the U-boat attacks Britannic. Also, Britannic did not have an escort on her final voyage, and if she did, it couldn't have been the HMS Victoria, a ship that had sunk two decades prior. It doesn't really matter, just something I found interesting. This scene in particular, though, is exactly what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned the cartoonish levels of insanity scenes can sometimes devolve into. Specifically the ending, when Townsend whips out the Lewis gun and starts shooting the torpedo hurling at Britannic. Somehow, he is successful. This could never work in your life, and it just adds to the fever dream of an experience this movie is. Okay. So the makeshift Molotov cocktail blows a hole in the ship, which is shown to be open on the starboard bow by this short CGI clip. However, a few seconds later, Townsend tells Captain Bartlett that the damage is on the port bow. Damage is in the port bow at one of the coal bunkers. Also, the time of day to which the makeshift Molotov explosion takes place isn't terribly off since Britannic did sink in the morning, but the initial explosion took place at 8:12 a.m which doesn't seem to be the case in the movie. This sinking sequence has a whole lot of problems, most of which were most likely honest mistakes as compared to deliberate changes made to fit the plot. The time to which the explosion takes place is most certainly for plot reasons, at least I hope it is. What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? Leave me! I can't. I can't leave you like this. I hate you for what you've done, but I can't let you die. This may seem very doom and gloom, but he's probably going to die anyway, or face a life sentence at the very least. Reynolds committed a war crime by sinking a hospital ship, armed or not, and would most likely face criminal prosecution if he survived, so unless Vera is willing to cover up the terrorist act he committed, trying to save him would really only serve to put herself in danger when she had an opportunity to board a lifeboat. The only reason why she goes back to save him is because she cares about him. They did the deed in one of the most contrived love plot lines I've ever seen. Yet again, a story about two spies of the opposite side falling in love could have worked in a film with better writing, but as it stands, the characters of Vera Campbell and Chaplin Reynolds have absolutely zero chemistry, so when they inevitably kiss, it comes out of nowhere. In this one shot with Captain Bartlett looking over his ship as it sinks, the time of day is clearly shown to be set at sunrise. In the following scene, however, while our main characters are fighting to escape the foundering Britannic, we cut to another exterior shot of the ship where the time of day is clearly not sunrise. This was definitely an editing mistake, so I won't brush over it too long, but it perfectly showcases how little the people who made this movie cared about not only the historical period the film takes place in, but also just the production of the movie in general. This movie was most certainly only made to cash in on James Cameron's Titanic, and you really don't even need to watch the movie to figure this out. Clearing your mind from the fact that Britannic is Titanic's sister ship, can you give me a compelling plotline that would prompt the making of a feature-length dramatized retelling of Britannic sinking? I'm sure you could come up with a compelling plotline given enough time, so perhaps a better question I could ask is, why does this plotline need to be centered around Britannic specifically? Why does Britannic deserve a feature-length movie as compared to a ship such as Lusitania, Wilhelm Gustloff, Empress of Ireland, and many other far more interesting and impactful sinkings? What about Britannic sinking is so interesting, besides the propeller mutilation, that warrants so much time and money? As much as I love Britannic, you have to admit that her sinking really wasn't anything special in the grand scheme of World War I. Nothing impactful really came out of it. Sure, White Star Line was damaged beyond repair and never really recovered from Britannic's loss, but her sinking was kind of forgotten, just another casualty of the war. There was no real blame to be placed, it was just another accident during the war that could have happened to any ship. Britannic was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I see a lot of people say that a film about Britannic would have worked better if James Cameron was at the helm, but I honestly disagree. The problem with the Britannic movie isn't a problem exclusive to THE Britannic movie, but rather, any possible film dramatizing her sinking. This problem comes from the fact that, 
there's nothing really interesting to go off of like there is with Titanic sinking. Nothing to comment on, nothing to base a fictional plot on. Because of this, plots such as the one in the Britannic movie face a real challenge and end up having to change history drastically to make for a more compelling movie. You don't really need to do this with a movie such as James Cameron's Titanic, but you do with a film where the story you want to tell doesn't work with the setting you've chosen. A spy flick surrounding a single agent attempting to uncover evidence of arms aboard while simultaneously evading exposure from another agent simply doesn't work very well with the limitations imposed by Britannic, or more specifically, the timeline of events leading up to Britannic's sinking. So you end up having to make major alterations to history, changes by the way that wouldn't be necessary if you chose a more fitting setting. A ship like Lusitania would work way better for this plotline, especially given the real-life controversy of Lusitania carrying arms and ammunition at the time of her sinking. But no. Because of the massive success of Titanic at the box office, they just had to get a piece of that $2.2 billion pie, and hastily put together a lazy movie surrounding Titanic's sister without any of the love or care of James Cameron's film. Also, in the same shot, the ship goes from an even keel to a mild starboard list in the span of a second, which looks pretty bad. Water doesn't just randomly decide to move from one side of the ship to the other randomly. During Titanic's sinking, for example, while she did list from one side to another, eventually coming to rest on an almost even keel during her final plunge, this happened over the course of hours, not a single second. I'm not saying that it's impossible for a list to quickly develop during a sinking for a variety of possible reasons, but just not in the way shown here. How convenient that they surface right next to a lifeboat. While it's true that multiple lifeboats were caught in Britannic's port propeller during the sinking, resulting in 30 deaths, the two lifeboats, one filled with crew and the other occupied by our lone German spy, are destroyed by the starboard propeller. I honestly feel like a broken record at this point, so I don't think I need to elaborate. I could have gone to more detail about the events leading up to Reynolds' heroic sacrifice, Let's face it, he probably would have been worse off if he had survived the sinking. But I was genuinely bored by this point of the movie, and I do not for the life of me want to be put through 10 minutes of our main character swimming again. Yeah, the last 20 minutes or so of this movie really drag for me, especially the last few scenes. The whole movie is just a nothing experience, and besides a few bonkers scenes during the second act as well as the insane physics defying final plunge, I can't imagine why anyone would want to put themselves through such a devoid of life, empty, and passionless piece of cinema unless you are A, a little kid who doesn't really have a frame of reference for what makes a good film, or B, a middle-aged man who's dedicated their entire life to the mindless consumption of History Channel documentaries. Hey, if that's what rose your boat, more power to you. I'm not going to try and call you out simply for enjoying a film that I think is bad, as I've unfortunately done in the past. People simply stating their opinion on why they like the movie and why they disagree with me. I respect that, and usually when that happens, I am able to explain why those aspects also suck. Yeah, admittedly, as you probably already seen from the title, I have a lot of criticism for how my past self slandered this movie. While I'm glad the video exists purely because of how much notoriety my channel gained from it, my initial approach to assessing the Britannic movie was off by a good bit. Seriously, out of all the terrible aspects I could have gone to detail about, I chose to dedicate a 20 minute long video to talk about the set design, CGI, as well as the sinking. While yes, these aspects of the movie are pretty rough, in the end, who really cares if the sets aren't 100% accurate to Britannic's deck plans? Who really cares if the CGI looks like crap? It is one of the many limitations that comes with a small budget and limited time, and I really didn't need to spend a full video analyzing such insignificant points. I could have taken the time to really dig deep into the roots of why the Britannic movie fails in every regard, but I instead took the easiest way out, choosing the most surface level approach of 
the CGI and sets don't look as good as a movie with a $200 million budget. Yes, I was correct with my initial judgment. The Britannic movie does in fact suck, but I simply miss the point as to why it sucks, choosing to look at the movie in the lens of a narrow-minded ship enthusiast when, in reality, film critique requires much more of an intellectual approach to properly assess a movie's quality. It doesn't matter that the CGI looks bad, plenty of movies and TV shows with less than stellar CGI still hold up in ways that intelligent people will care about far more, such as the storytelling and underlying themes. By far the biggest issue with the Britannic movie is that it has no underlying themes as well as no real ending come to think of it, leaving you feeling empty by the end, as if you've gained nothing from the experience. None of the characters have any development or arcs, and even our main protagonist, Vera Campbell, learns nothing by the end, and if she did, we sure as hell don't get to see it since the movie just decides to end before any kind of resolution. Seriously, it was shocking how out of place the fade to black and credits were. It's almost like the writers forgot to write in a proper ending to the movie, but it's more likely that they didn't care. But out of all the very many problems I could have discussed, I chose the two most inconsequential problems to the bigger picture issue I could muster, so I probably didn't care, much like the filmmakers of the Britannic movie. That or I didn't have as much of an intellectual understanding of the art of filmmaking as I do now. Either way, I was wrong. I will never make another full length video on the Britannic movie. Not because I've exhausted all the possible talking points I could muster up, but because I've realized through the process of writing the script for this video that the movie is simply not worth my time. When I first started writing the script for this video, I was enthusiastic and passionate, making sure to elaborate as much as possible to provide as little ambiguity as I could. As I wrote more and more though, diving deeper and deeper down the Britannic movie rabbit hole, it felt as if the life force was being drained from my body, and I became less and less optimistic as I went on. There is so much I could say about this dumpster fire of a production, and it became clear that I wouldn't be able to give the same amount of elaboration and general commentary for every issue I found unless I wanted an hour long video. This is one of the reasons why I largely ignored most of the final act, the commentary I did give being pretty surface level. It became painfully obvious that I didn't have the time or passion to provide a consistent level of script writing quality throughout the full length of the video, which initially was pretty demoralizing, but I eventually accepted that fact, realizing that the Britannic movie really doesn't need, let alone deserve, a full analysis. I have to wonder if the creators behind projects such as the Britannic movie feel similarly as their ambitions get the best of them, realizing they've created something far too big for the amount of time and resources allotted, forcing themselves to significantly cut back in certain aspects. The main difference between me and the creators behind the Britannic movie though is that, in cinema, Creative cutbacks tend to come from greedy executives that don't give a crap about the art or artist and just want to make a quick buck. In the end, it could have simply been that no one involved with the Britannic movie had any sort of passion for what they were creating, but I really can't say for sure since there isn't much I could find on the movie's production besides some photos and a book I have. Maybe one day I could find someone who worked on the movie and ask them a few questions about its production. Until then though, we can only really speculate as to the reasons why the Britannic movie does, in fact, suck.